Hey everyone, I'd like to design my own custom UI for my Monoprice Select Mini 3D printer. Why? Because I'm thinking of a couple of features that are missing and because it's a fun project. But before writing some software, we obviously need to know our enemy and reverse engineer all the hardware components. What I already know is that there are two main PCBs in this printer. Both of them have separate microcontrollers and separate firmware updates. Since one of them is driving the display, I may be able to write my own firmware for that. My name's Robin and in this video I'll show you every detail in how I reverse engineered this product. So if you like, grab a cup of coffee and join me on the journey. So one of the two boards is driving the steppers and all the other hardware stuff. The other one is directly attached to the display and to the control knob assembly. So as we can start prints, preheat the extruder or even directly drive one axis right from within the UI, there must be a way how the display unit can send commands over to the motion controller board. But before we hook up the oscilloscope, let's first take a look at both boards. Since my goal is to write a new firmware for the display board, the motion board here is not too important today. But since both boards are connected and somehow send commands to each other, it's necessary to at least get an overview. So on the motion controller we have a 32-bit STM32F103 running at 72 MHz. It has a USB 2.0 full speed interface, supports SD cards, has two UART interfaces and much more. This is actually where the magic happens. It will take G-code, translate it into stepper motor commands and make sure both heating elements reach and keep their temperatures. On the right side we have a simple buck converter setup based on an XL1509 DC to DC converter IC. It's outputting 3.3 volts at a maximum of 2 amps. So while both MOSFETs, the little fan and the steppers are driven by 12 volts, all the other electronic components like the STM32 or the display board are supplied by that buck converter. Back on the left side there's a 4 pin connector to which the display board is connected. By simply testing all pins I found out that the outer two are directly connected to ground and VCC and the inner ones to RX and TX of one of the UART ports of the STM32. Alright, so let's switch over to the display board. It is glued onto the backside of a 480 by 320 pixel TFT display. The main controller here is an ESP8266 running at 80 MHz. Since these microcontrollers do not have integrated flash memory for storing our firmware, it's connected to a 4 MB Winbond flash memory. Even though Monoprice did not officially call Wi-Fi a feature, we do have a PCB antenna for the 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi signal. On the bottom right corner there's a circuit which seems to be for driving the backlight of the display. I could not find any datasheet for the little IC there, but I'm pretty sure it's boosting up the voltage to something the display backlight needs. A 74HC1 for Schmidt trigger is used to hardware debounce inputs from the control knob. And a little NPM transistor drives the two LEDs lighting up that outer ring of the knob. Great, so that we now know the basic layout and purpose of both boards, we can take the next step. Let's start with the communication between both boards and just hook up the oscilloscope to see what happens. From the datasheet of the ESP8266 and by tracing the inner pins of the connector, I know that the right pin is connected to the receive and the left one to the transmit pin of the ESP. After soldering in a ground wire for my oscilloscope probes and connecting the whole assembly to an external power source, I was able to capture some UART data while moving one axis. So let's take a closer look at what's being sent. Unfortunately it seems that I didn't stick to one of the common UART board rates. But if you measure the length of the shortest pulse by for example setting two cursors in an oscilloscope, you can easily determine the rate of which they transmit. In my case that pulse is about 2 microseconds long. And if you now take 1 divided by 2 microseconds, which is 1 divided by 2 times 10 to the power of 6, you get 500 kilobaud. Most of the oscilloscopes already calculate that if you enable cursors. In my case it's displaying a frequency of 500 kHz which can obviously be interpreted as 500 kilobaud. Great, if I now zoom out to see the whole packet, we can see what is being sent after moving the x-axis in a positive direction. It seems that they wrap all commands in curly brackets. I'm not entirely sure what the first J is meant to be, but it is followed by a colon and then what seems to be something like x plus 200. If I acquire another packet while moving in negative direction, I'll get x minus 200. So I assume the letter before the colon is some sort of command and all the stuff behind is the corresponding value. After playing around for a while, I found out that all the three axes work the same way with x, y and z plus minus 200. But there are a ton of interesting commands. For example, s colon l will ask the motion controller for a complete list of g-code files on the SD card. But let's keep things short, you'll find a complete list of all commands linked in the video description. Alright, so what's next? We know all the commands the UI controller can possibly send. But can we also send regular g-code? At least I know that we are able to upload a G-code file through its built-in web server. 
As that server is running on the display controller, it has to be able to send G-code over to the motion site. So the first thing I've checked is the source code of the built-in website. They implemented a set HTTP endpoint with two possible GET parameters. The first one is called CMD and it seems like we can directly send the commands from before via HTTP. The other one, named code, looks like it accepts raw G code. And if I now for example use that route and send the homing command G28, the printer actually starts doing that. Now when taking a look at the UR transfer, we can see that they wrapped it into a carriage return and a new line character. And that's how we could even send multiple G-code commands at once. That means the new firmware could not only use existing commands, but the entire palette of supported G-codes. It could, for example, display and change settings like the filament diameter, PID values and much more. So what next? To be able to write and publish a new firmware, we obviously have to figure out what kind of display they used and how we can interface with that. First I did a lot of Google searching with all the part numbers I found on the display and then I even contacted the display manufacturer for help. But none of that helped. There's no datasheet, no specification or any other useful piece of information available. But I'm not willing to quit here. Let's take the hacking approach. First I had to figure out what kind of bus is driving it. I was pretty sure it was SPI, but to be sure I traced all lines that come from or go to the display. I figured out that there are only three instead of the four common SPI signal lines. We have both the clock and chip select, but only one data line. So that means Marian is driving the display in a so-called 3-wire SPI mode, but I'll come back to that later on. So now it's gonna get a bit tricky. We have to sniff the traffic sent by the ESP and somehow use that to figure out what display driver they used. To do that I've sorted in three very fine gauge wires to all of the SPI pins and used these to hook up my logic analyzer. Then I recorded the session while the display controller was booting and showing the login screen. But before we look at that, let's take a second to get an overview about how such displays work in general. I was talking about a display driver, but what does it actually mean? If you take a look, we just have a display connected to the display controller board. But what you don't see is a little chip that is encapsulated into the display unit itself. It sits between the actual LCD panel and the flat flex cable used to interface with it. So why do we need an extra chip? I mean, we already have an ESP8266, which is responsible for things like drawing buttons, icons and so on. Well, the reason for that is pretty obvious. In our case we have a 320 by 480 pixel display, and that's 153,600 pixel in total. So if we would like to address each one individually, we would theoretically need over 150,000 GPIO pins. And let alone colors, each pixel consists of a red, green and blue portion that you might want to drive separately. Sure you could do stuff like multiplexing to save a couple of pins, but it would still be a huge mess. And that's why the display manufacturers typically integrate a driver IC within their displays. They take care about the heavy lifting and usually accept the range of serial and parallel buses. SPI for example is just one way to talk to that driver. These drivers usually accept two different kinds of packets. You can either send a command or a data packet. A command could be something like setting the display's orientation. A data packet on the other hand is used to set RGB values of individual pixels. So let's pretend we want to draw a green 10 by 10 pixel square. The way this works is that we first have to select a drawing window by sending a certain command. That command consists of an origin X and Y value as well as a width and a height. And after selecting the window, the driver will use every incoming RGB packet to fill up that square. So we have to send 100 packets until our square is fully drawn. I think you got the basic idea. Pretty much all common display drivers work after this principle. But enough of the theory, let's take a look what actually got sent. So this is the entire traffic of the loading screen. The first couple of packets are clearly for setting up the display before anything can be drawn. The big chunk at the end is actually the RGB data for each pixel. So if I zoom into the very first packet that got transmitted, we can see that the clock actually got high 9 times. That means the ESP has sent 9 instead of typically 8 bits per packet. That is the three-wire SPI mode which I mentioned before. The first bit is used to indicate if this particular packet should be considered as a data or a command packet. If the first bit is low, we are looking at a command. If it's high, it's data. If you would drive it with four wires, you'll have an extra signal line instead of the first bit. I know that most of the displays are powering up with random GRAM content. If we just powered it on, we would see random pixel appearing on the screen. As we don't want that in our final product, the first thing a programmer would typically do is to turn off the internal clock so the display stops drawing content. After that you typically call a sleepout method to get the driver ready for accepting commands and data. 
In my logic analyzer software, I see that the first two commands being sent are 0x28 and 0x11. I'm 95% sure that these are the display off and sleep out commands I mentioned before right there. So I searched for all drivers that support 3-wire SPI and are able to drive a 320 by 480 pixel display. All of their datasheets have a complete list of supported commands and there I started searching for the 0x28 and 0x11 command. Now this took me a while but I found a very promising candidate. The HiMax HX8357 seems to be the closest match. The selection of the drawing window and how they push RGB data seems to match the specification. So what do you think? Shall we give it a try? We should now have enough information to start writing our own firmware. But before I start writing code, I'd like to improve my hacky test trick. The SPI wires are pretty loose and might fall off at any time. Also I'd like to put that display back into the printer while keeping the logic analyzer connected. So give me a minute to improve that. Great, so now I can safely connect my analyzer without having to fear that one of the small wires will break off. Also I could now reinstall this board into the printer and connect my analyzer at any time. So let's do some software. Before I upload my own code I'd like to back up the stock firmware so I can go back at any time. I won't cover too much details in how to flash an ESP because there are so many videos explaining just that. The same UART port that was used to communicate back to the motion controller is also used to reprogram the ESP. So I've now connected a USB to serial adapter to that port and powered on the unit while pressing the control knob button. This will let the MCU boot into a serial bootloader. It's now in a state where it accepts a new firmware or lets us download the entire flash content. To make a flash backup I use something called ESP tool. It's officially supported by Expressive and due to the fact that it's a Python script it should run on almost any platform. You'll find a link to that in the video description. As the download of the 4 MB flash takes a while, I'll just fast forward. So that we now have a complete backup of the entire flash, we can finally write some code. I've created a new platform IO project and verified that we can successfully upload our code. The first thing I made here is setting up the SPI connection to the display. As we should send 9-bit instead of the common 8-bit per transfer, we cannot just use the SPI library provided by the Arduino framework. We have to make use of the official expressive SPI libraries. For now, the two methods for sending a command and a data packet are most important. As a short recap, both contain one byte of payload plus a single bit at the beginning, indicating if it's a command or a data packet. So with the datasheet of the driver and my code side by side, I rebuilt all the initialization stuff and commanded out each step. Most of the commands require one or more parameters. You simply send the command first and then all payload as data packets. Also, I've made my driver class a subclass of the Arduino GFX library. This enables us to draw text, images, simple shapes and so on. All we have to provide is a method that draws a single pixel. After that we are pretty much ready to draw something. By uploading this code we can finally see that we successfully reverse engineered the UI module of this printer. How cool is that? Now what's next? Well, as this video is already pretty long and fully packed with all kinds of interesting stuff, I call it a day, make this my initial comment and move the software stuff into another video. As always you can find links to the interesting stuff seen in my videos in the description. I do have a couple of Amazon affiliate links pointing to the stuff I use. As you might already know, you will pay the exact same price as you would without that affiliate link. The only difference is that I get a small cut from Amazon. I have a long list of very interesting projects about electronics hacking and 3D printing that I'd like to share with you. Supporting me through Amazon links, Patreon or Paypal will make it possible for me to make YouTube videos more often. It also supports me if you subscribe to my channel and share the video with your friends. I really hope you liked this video and learned something today. I'll see you next time.